Hello, and welcome to The Obscure Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, a new series that you all voted for, and by an overwhelming margin, I might add. I've had my eye on this one for a long time, because you know on this channel, we love the super obscure ones. The Iceberg was created by Redditor Sustained Disgust, whom I give thanks to. This mystery iceberg, well, it's not your typical one. It's not filled with grisly unsolved murders or creepy unexplained disappearances. So if a high body count is your thing, this might not be the series for you. However, if you like off the wall crazy and bizarre mysteries, then you're at the right place. The categories are broken down into the following. Unexplained phenomena, conspiracy theories, fringe and pseudoscience theories, cryptids, people and beings, death and disappearances, and finally, internet legends and memes. But before I get started, I want to thank the members of this channel who make doing these videos so much easier. I appreciate you all so much, and I hope you find this video interesting. And if you would like to support the channel, you can do so by clicking the join button to become a member, or a super thanks is also appreciated. Now, let's start our descent into one of the wackiest mystery icebergs I have ever seen. Starting with Fern Flowers. We start here with a very weird cryptid, that of the mythical fern flower. The fern flower is a concept deeply rooted in Slavic folklore, particularly in countries like Russia, Poland, Ukraine, and Belarus, as well as in Estonian and Baltic folklore. The mystery revolves around the belief that this enchanted flower that blooms only on one specific night during the year, often during the very short time of the eve of summer solstice, which is celebrated on June 21st or July 7th. The flower's bloom lasts only about an hour before it dies, although sometimes it's recorded that it dies at dawn. The allure of the plant is its magical properties, which supposedly grant anyone who finds it special abilities, such as good fortune, wisdom, wealth, wishes, youth, or sometimes it even allows the person to understand animals. It really kind of depends on the version of the story you hear. This, as you can imagine, encouraged many to try and find them. The myth is only strengthened by the fact that it can only be found in the dead of night at a particular moment when everything is quiet, and that is if you're even in the right location to begin with, because it's said that it lies deep in the forest in hard to reach areas. This of course only enhances the mystique and sense of adventure in trying to find the plant. The story has been passed down through generations in Slavic cultures, becoming part of their identity, and it's structured in such a way to make whoever is brave enough to go out and look for it to feel like a hero. It's kind of like an old initiation rite for young men. The description of the flower itself is that it has a glow around it which can be seen at dark, and that glow is a red, gold, or purple color, and that's pretty much it. No other characteristics of the plant were actually passed down in these stories. You're probably thinking, okay, that might be an interesting mythical story, but it's just that, a myth, no mystery. Yeah, about that. Ferns are not what you call flowering plants. They have neither seeds nor flowers, and since modern plant taxonomy is not exactly the same as early plant taxonomy, there's a good chance that this plant is real, or at least was, and it was just originally misidentified as a fern by early botanists. There are numerous flowering plants that resemble ferns though, and some of those even have flowers that open during the middle of the night. So there lies the mystery. What was this plant? Some botanists speculate it could be certain plants that produce showy spore-bearing leaves called sporophylls, which gather into something like flower clusters. Some even give off a golden look. Other candidates are that of the moonflower, or a buttercup, or an epiphyte, which sometimes the leaves form into fleshy beautiful spikes and grow into a long stalk. And finally, there's other speculation that it could have been that of an ostrich plume. But to me, it opens up other questions. If the flower is real, or at least was at one time, then where did all the stories about the magical properties come from? And what about its supposed glow? Or is it possible this plant, when found and possibly consumed, did it have some kind of hallucinogenic effect that led to the belief that people had these magical gifts, even if for a short period? I'm not sure, although I do wonder how many people got injured looking for one of these in the middle of the night in treacherous woodlands. The Cult of the Nobody The next one is a conspiracy theory that revolves around this person 
who has special abilities, which consist of extraordinary spiritual powers and the ability to control reality with their mind. This powerful individual, though, is going through some kind of turmoil, which is having an effect on the real world, hence the chaos of our current time. This turmoil is said to have been caused by a female love interest of this person. She was either an ex-girlfriend or possibly just someone he had feelings for, and she likes to toy with his emotions, which is made only worse by the fact that the nobody does not know that he has this power, and if he did, he could use his powers to change the world for the better, but he can't because he's always in an emotionally unstable state because of this girl who is toying with him. Although in later tellings, this has changed some to reflect the possibility that a girl is actually the nobody and that she is being led on by a guy, or that the emotion instability is caused by something else other than a relationship. Regardless, let's get back to the important part I skimmed over. The most important and powerful person in the world is a nobody. He's not a celebrity, not a CEO, not a world leader. He's literally the everyday Joe or Jane going into their crappy job or sitting at home watching YouTube videos. Which brings us to the fascinating part of this theory. Since the nobody doesn't even know he has this power, because he doesn't know he's the nobody, well then, the nobody could be you. It's a total ego-driven conspiracy, which ego itself ties into conspiracy theories anyway. What I mean is, taking the stance on a certain conspiracy is almost always ego-driven, because you are stating that you know something more than the casual masses of people know. You're smarter than them, which is what draws a lot of people into conspiracies in the first place. The fact is, you may not be rich or tall or as good looking as the next person, but that doesn't matter because you're smarter than him when it comes to the truth behind this conspiracy. It's that kind of thinking, times a thousand, that makes up the cult of the nobody. This theory got popular on the paranormal board on 4chan, where there is always a nobody general thread going on, and a large amount of the posting in those threads are people who are convinced they're actually the nobody, and they will try and find pieces of their life that fit the story of the nobody theory to prove that it's really them. But although this theory is discussed mainly on the paranormal board of 4chan, or 4channel, it actually got its first start in 2010 on a website called Godlike Productions, which is a conspiracy forum. The original thread there stated that the Illuminati was dealt a wild card that they didn't know how to contend with. God had chosen a nobody whom much of the world hangs in balance of this person. That thread after going well over 2,000 pages, would eventually be locked, and then it would be picked up on 4chan, where it is active to this day. The mystery is the conspiracy itself. Is the nobody real? If you think you might be the nobody, I'd love for you to let me know why in the comments section below. The Sheep Goat Effect The Sheep Goat Effect is a concept in parapsychology that pertains to the relationship between an individual's beliefs and their experiences with paranormal or psychic phenomena. It's named after the sheep and goat, representing believers and skeptics, respectively. The basic idea of the sheep-goat effect is that individuals who are more inclined to believe in paranormal or psychic phenomena, the sheep, are more likely to report experiencing such phenomena, while individuals who are skeptical about these claims, the goats, are less likely to report such experiences. In other words, believers in the paranormal are more likely to attribute unusual experiences to paranormal causes, whereas skeptics are more likely to explain those same experiences through conventional or non-paranormal explanations. The sheep-goat effect has been a subject of interest in parapsychological research because it raises questions about the role of personal beliefs and biases in the interpretation of unusual experiences. Critics of this effect argue that believers may be more prone to perceiving or attributing events as paranormal due to their pre-existing beliefs, while proponents suggest that believers are simply more open to recognizing genuine paranormal experiences. Regardless, the whole theory kind of points to a broader issue with people who have witnessed paranormal events and the skeptics who have tried to debunk them. That is, you can't trust either side, because both are judging these events based on their experiences and individual beliefs rather than the event itself. For example, many mundane things can explain ghosts or UFO sightings, but believers, aka the sheep, will almost always jump to the ghost or UFO conclusion first. Likewise, if a UFO landed in a skeptic's yard 
and an alien knocked on his door and said they were from another galaxy, skeptics would close the door and write the entire thing off as swamp gas, which leads to another irony. Skeptics don't even believe in the sheep goat effect because it comes from parapsychology, which they deem as a pseudoscience. But the strangest part of this effect, and where the mystery really lies, is the psychic task that have been given to both believers and skeptics over the years. These can be simple tasks, like holding up a cue card with a number on the opposite side and asking the participant to guess that number, or holding up a cue card with a shape or color, etc, etc, you get the point. But in these tasks, the participants who believe in ESP, or believe they have psychic abilities, aka the sheep, score way higher than the skeptics, or the goats, when it comes to guessing what is hidden on the other side of the card, getting a better score than the skeptic 80-90% to 90 of the time, suggesting that people who witness paranormal events may have a gift that enables them to. Of course, the skeptic just talks it up to bad luck on guessing what's on the cue card. Advertisers can read your mind. This is a fringe theory that I'm pretty sure we have all wondered about before. Have you ever scrolled through Facebook or just be browsing the web and come across an ad for something you was thinking about buying? And I'm speaking specifically about something you have never searched for online, but yet these ads somehow know that you were thinking about buying that particular item. Well, that can usually be chalked up to various analytics and pattern detection that are ran on your other searches which sometimes can accurately predict what you may want or need. But what if a technology was created that could read your mind? Well, in 2019, a group of scientists did just that, sorta. They announced that it was now possible to read human thoughts by analyzing signals sent from within the brain. This technology was actually created for a good reason. It was designed to allow people paralyzed by a stroke, neurodegenerative disease, or a traumatic brain injury to communicate with the outside world. It was accomplished by a team from the University of California, San Francisco and worked with volunteers who already had electrodes placed on the surface of their brains to gather data ahead of a major surgery. These researchers were then able to use machine learning to recognize the sound, for lack of a better term, that the brain made in response to questions. It then used that data to decode the contents of the brain transmissions. It was deemed a massive success and scientists were able to instantly identify three volunteers spoken responses to a set of standard questions based solely on their brain activity. That was a first. So what does this have to do with the mystery of advertisers reading your mind, you may ask? Well, this research and these scientists were funded by Facebook Reality Labs, which wanted to create a non-invasive brain interface that would allow people to simply think about what they wanted to type. This has led to all kinds of conjecture and fear that Zuckerberg could be researching this technology in hopes of eventually being able to read everyone's mind, or at least everyone who uses Facebook. You can see where this would be very dangerous and unethical, because all the data about your thoughts would become accessible to advertisers. It's called neural marketing, and the field is just getting started, and it's just not Facebook and other companies that could use it. What about governments? However, in defense of Zuckerberg, Defenders point out that there's nothing sinister about this technology, and instead, it was built with good intentions to help those with disabilities to communicate, and that even if there were evil intentions, decoding what someone wants to say is very far off from actually reading someone's inner thoughts. Finally, it's hard to argue against a technology that would allow one to communicate with an incapacitated loved one, but I ask you, how do you feel about it? Transported Soldier 1593. I will be up front on this one. This is one of my favorite mysteries ever. I had actually heard about it years ago, and I've always wanted to cover it. The story allegedly occurred in 1593, and revolves around a soldier who was guarding the governor's palace in Manila, in what was then the Spanish Philippines. The governor of this Spanish colony on the other side of the world was Gomez Perez de Marinas, and without going into all the details, this governor would actually end up being killed by Chinese pirates of all things. Now, if we go to the following day of his assassination, we get back to the heart of our mystery, that of the soldier that was guarding the governor's building. This soldier, sometimes named Hill Perez, would begin to find himself dizzy and exhausted, which might not have been super uncommon when standing out in the sunlight guarding a palace all day long. Regardless, the soldier would lean up against the palace wall 
and slowly let his eyes come to rest. But it was only a few seconds before he snapped back out of his slumber and awoken, no doubt hoping that his superior officer did not catch him asleep on his watch. But upon waking, he was in for a different shock. No longer did he see the Manila government building, nor did he see Manila. Instead, he seen the main square of Mexico City, almost 9,000 miles away from where he had fell asleep. As he started to walk around and take in what had happened, the Mexico City guards seen him in the wrong uniform and went up to question who he was. He would begin to tell them what had happened, even going over the news of the assassination of the governor of the Philippines, which was still unknown in Mexico since news spread so much slower back then. The authorities started to suspect this man was nothing more than a deserter who came up with a story to cover up for leaving his post. They would throw him in jail and charge him with desertion and being a servant of the devil for some reason. However, months later, news finally reached Mexico's shores via a galleon from the Philippines that the governor had indeed been assassinated. But not stopping there with the weirdness, one of the ship's passengers would go to Mexico City where he came across the imprisoned soldier. He would then go to the authorities and made a statement verifying that this imprisoned soldier, Gil Perez, was 100% in Manila the day after the assassination of the governor. The authorities were now even more perplexed. The soldier, whom they thought was a deserter with a fanciful story, had actually brought them news from the Philippines that he had no way of knowing unless his story was true. So they actually released him and allowed him to go back home. So what gives? This story first came to prominence in the early 1900s when it found its way into magazines and collected stories about legends. One writer was able to trace the origin of the story to the account by a friar named Gaspar de San Agustin in 1698 who cites the story as a fact although he didn't know the soldier's name and blamed the whole event on witchcraft. We also have in 1609 a well-respected soldier slash historian Dr. Antonio de Morga who was stationed in Manila the day of the assassination. He recorded that everyone in Mexico did know of the news within the day that it happened yet he makes no mention of the teleported soldier. Instead he says they could not trace where the rumors had came from. So what happened? A lot of skeptics cite that the whole thing is nothing more than a legend and there were other miraculous stories from the Spanish Philippines at that time so it wouldn't be unusual and generally I would agree with that if it wasn't for Antonio de Morga's account. He was a reputable historian verifying that somehow Mexico was aware of the news shortly after it happened, which might be why some have stated the whole thing was an unexplained paranormal event, such as alien abduction or that he somehow teleported. The Lake Winnipesaukee Mystery Stone, 1872, near Lake Winnipesaukee, New Hampshire. Businessman Seneca Ladd hired some workers to start digging hose for fence posts when one of them would unearth the odd looking clump of dirt. Upon breaking the dirt apart, the men would find this odd stone, which is about 4 inches long, 2.5 inches thick, and weighing about 1.2 pounds. It's dark and egg-shaped, and has a variety of carved symbols, some of which, on one side, show an ear of corn and several other figures. The other side is more abstract, showing inverted arrows, a moon shape, some dots, and a spiral. While suspiciously, a hole at the top goes through the stone and comes out the bottom. I say suspiciously because the holes look like they were bored out by different size bits, but more on that in a minute. The stone is a mystery because its age, purpose, and origin are unknown. Although it was originally believed to be a Native American relic, that's never been proven. There have been other stones with a similar shape, often called stone eggs, found throughout the world, but this one was the first ever found in America, which has led many to speculate that it could be an out-of-place artifact, maybe of Celtic, Inuit, Aztec, or even Polynesian origins. After Seneca Lad died in 1892, he gave the stone to his daughter, and in 1927, she would donate it to the New Hampshire Historical Society, where it can be seen on exhibit at the Museum of New Hampshire History today. So, what is it? Well, one theory suggests that the stone was created by two Native American tribes to commemorate a treaty between themselves. In this theory, the hose allowed it to rest on a stake that marked a line between territories. It would also explain the carvings on the side. Another theory 
is that it was a thunderstone, which myth said was stones that fell from the sky during thunderstorms and were buried in the earth, which farmers then found. But the reality was these stones are more than likely a prehistoric tool or fossil, and upon finding them, they were often used as an amulet to protect a person or building, which could explain the hole that was bored into it. Speaking of the hole, a borescope analysis, which I had never heard of, was made on the stone in 1994, and the archaeologists found that the holes had the appearance of being drilled by power tools from the 19th or 20th century. He noted that in comparing it to holes bored in stone by the natives, which had a certain amount of unevenness, the hole in the Lake Winnipesaukee stone was extremely regular throughout. Basically, it was too good to have been done centuries ago. It was also found that several scratches in the lower bore suggested that it was placed on a metal shaft and removed several times, which leads to the theory that the whole thing was a hoax created by someone in the 1800s. However, others contradict this and point out that it's very possible the stone was crafted hundreds of years ago, only to be found by someone in the 1800s who then drilled a hole through it and used it as an amulet, or maybe the archaeologist is wrong altogether and the holes were created when the stone was, and maybe it was set down on a long stick and was then used as a tool. And if it wasn't a tool, it could have been a device as a way to keep records of a tribe's history. As far as the more wild theories go, some suggest that the rock was some sort of magnetized navigation device, perhaps a thousand years old, or that it was made by aliens, cause why not? Andrew D. Basiago Remember when I said in the intro that there are some wacky ones in this iceberg? Well, this one bypassed wacky and went straight to eccentric. Andrew D. Basiago is a Seattle lawyer and political activist who submitted himself as a candidate for president in the 2016 election. He ran on a platform consisting of 100 proposals, such as increasing wages for women, protecting social security, protecting the electric grid, making Sasquatch a protected species. Wait, what? Yeah, in addition to the normal proposals, Basiago also wanted the following, making Sasquatch a protected species, declassifying America's time travel arsenal, making the living presidents admit they were given foreknowledge of their destiny by this time travel arsenal, extraterrestrial disclosure, admitting that atomic explosions attracted ETs and that we have several treaties with other planet civilizations. Do I need to go on? It's possible that Basiago came up with all these other proposals because of his past. See, he is the founder of a group dedicated to disclosing data about Project Pegasus, which is described as classified defense-related research by DARPA in which the U.S. defense community achieved time travel. According to Basiago, the program began in the 70s and used children in its experiments because they could adapt well to the strain of moving between past, present, and future. And strap in for this one, because Basiago claims he was one of these children, and he went back in time to Ford's theater on the night that President Lincoln was assassinated. Actually, he went back and watched it five or six times, for some reason. He was actually even captured in a photograph at Gettysburg in 1963, which you can see here. Even crazier, as his travels back in time began to accumulate, he ran into himself twice on two different visits. A rarity, to say the least. According to Basiago, he got to try out eight different time travel technologies throughout the project, but most instances involved a teleporter based on some mechanical technical papers found in, drum roll please, Nikola Tesla's apartment after his death. The teleporter consisted of two gray elliptical booms, about eight feet tall, separated by about 10 feet, between a shimmering curtain of what Tesla called radiant energy that was broadcast. This energy, allegedly, had the capacity to bend space-time. In addition, during the period of his time traveling, Basiago got to go on a Martian exploration and colonization mission, along with a man named Barry Sotero, who would later become Barack Obama. For what it's worth, Basiago's claims have been confirmed by another lawyer named Alfred Weber, who claims the U.S. has had time travel technology for at least four decades, but it should be noted. Weber wrote a book documenting his experience of a briefing between himself and Jimmy Carter aboard a UFO in 1973. So I mean, I'm not sure how good his word is. Also, for what it's worth, Basiago, since he has been given the knowledge from the future, 
He knows he will win either the presidency or vice presidency between now and 2028, so there's that. Although, I admit, I am sad we didn't get to see him as a third candidate on stage in the 2016 election. So what is the mystery in this one? I guess, is any of this true? Normally, I would just say no, but I'm trying to remain unbiased here. So one of the first things people note about Basiago is his intelligence. He's a member of Mensa International, which means he's a genius, and possibly means that he would be a great candidate for these experiments. Secondly, the guy seems to believe wholeheartedly what he is saying. But I ask you, what do you believe? Ashoka's Nine Unknown We have all heard the tales of secret societies, which allegedly hide behind the veils of power of various world governments. It's a story that goes back centuries. Just a brief online search will bring up groups such as Skull and Bones, Illuminati, and the Freemasons. But there's one group you may have never heard of, that of the Nine Unknown Men, which is one of the longest running secret societies existing for more than 2,000 years, maybe. The society was first created by Ashoka the Great, the Mauryan Emperor of Magadha in India between the years 268 and 232 BC. Ashoka believed that knowledge was power, and the key to that power was to collect, nurture, and use that knowledge for good. But Ashoka was no fool, and he knew that if all this collected knowledge fell into the wrong hands, it could be used for evil purposes. It was said he was influenced to do this because of witnessing the Kalinga War, which cost nearly 250,000 lives and impacted Ashoka deeply. So his idea was to summon nine of the most brilliant minds in ancient India to form this secret society, hence the name, the Nine Unknown. They would together preserve and develop knowledge that would be dangerous to humanity if it fell into the wrong hands. These nine unknown men were entrusted with guarding the nine books of that secret knowledge in the hopes of keeping peace throughout mankind, which you know, probably didn't work. These men came from various fields of study, and the society was built around the concept of having expertise in the following nine disciplines. Propaganda, physiology, microbiology, alchemy, communication, gravity, cosmogony, light, and sociology. Even more mysterious was that some of the knowledge discovered fell between these nine disciplines and would be deemed as forbidden knowledge and kept secret even to this day. Although, it is believed that Judo was one of the only forbidden knowledges that ever got leaked from the secret society, as well as rumors about a legendary way to kill someone by a single touch called the touch of death. In the field of communication, the nine unknown studied the most advanced form, of which apparently meant communicating with aliens, while using the alchemy field to convert metals to gold and using the knowledge of gravity to build an aircraft. They also studied ways to use light as a weapon. The society was also founded in such a way that if a member quit, become incapacitated, or died, a worthy member would be chosen in his place. So the society would continue in the pattern of having exactly nine members at all time. And that's where we get to the most interesting part of this story. That is, a couple of pretty famous and influential scientists were said to be members. That of Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. The mystery is, did this society ever really exist? And if so, do they still? Most claim the whole thing is a legend that was popularized by a fictional story called The Nine Unknown, written by Talbot Mundy in 1923. Actually, most claim the whole story was concocted by Mundy himself, and then conspiracy theorists took it to be based on truth and ran with it. Or is that just what the secret society wants us to believe? New Mill Mystery Blob I know these are supposed to be obscure mysteries, but this one is almost too obscure. I can barely find anything about it. What little I can find comes from the book Mysteries of Mind, Space, and Time, The Unexplained, which is really just a collection of several of the magazines of the same name. Found in one of these magazines from the early 80s is an article describing a theory known as window areas, which are these areas that allegedly have more paranormal activity than others. We'll come back to the window area theory in a second, but let's take a closer look at the New Mill Mystery Blob, our mystery at hand. This strange encounter took place in September 1977 in the village of New Mill in Cornwall, England. One evening, 
a couple known only as Peter and Caroline, were renovating an old stone post office. Caroline would end up stepping outside when she seen something truly bizarre. Right in front of her was a luminous green and red object about six feet in diameter. She called for Peter. He ran out and seen the same mysterious object, which they would later describe as a UFO. It would float up the ramp of a barn behind the house, where it then zigzagged across the field, before finally drifting out over a plateau about a mile away, coming to a rest, where it sat for hours. The entire event was witnessed by around 30 people. The craziest part in all of this, though, was that it happened again the following evening, except this time, there were four similar objects hovering about, where it was again witnessed by several people. In spite of this being a once-in-a-lifetime sighting, it didn't work out well for Caroline and Peter. Of all the people to see this UFO, they were the only two that came into close contact, and that is important because both would have to be taken to the hospital immediately afterwards. They started to suffer stomach pains, headaches, and nausea after the blob had left. Doctors tried to treat the two, but could find no cause for the symptoms, which was noted to be very similar to radiation sickness. The two, fortunately, made a recovery after the symptoms disappeared a week later. Although this is a bizarre story, it seems to be well corroborated and taken as fact, but there might actually be an explanation that goes back to the theory of window areas we discussed earlier. In this theory, it's speculated that in the underground of these window areas potentially lies bodies of highly conductive material buried in the rock. During increased solar activity, this normally dormant mass of stone may become electrically charged and generate a large electromagnetic field around it. This superfield would then have the strength to generate luminous effects such as balls of light. Furthermore, this alleged superfield could cause electrical interference of the brain, causing hallucinations. Going back to Peter and Caroline, it is possible that the rock body under the stone post office could have caused the ball of light, perhaps even channeled by the stone walls of the post office. That same ball of light may have induced their illnesses through possible microwave radiations, hence why people who saw it at a distance didn't get sick. Of course, it's all just speculation, and it's a pretty bizarre, unproven theory, and no one is really for sure what the people of New Mill seen those two nights. Stickman. This mystery comes from the High Strangeness subreddit. The original poster, that of Farmers Are Ninja, would ask for help with the weird little mystery. Apparently, in his hometown, which he left anonymous, had a local legend called Stickman. This man was a very tall, very skinny, and very real elderly gentleman. This man had spent a few hours every day since the 80s meticulously arranging sticks on his front lawn, and no one knows why. And before you think that this is a made-up story, the original poster would actually post a screenshot taken from Google Earth years ago that showed the sticks lying perfectly arranged in the yard in front of his home. They looked to be laid out as some sort of text or language, like a way of communication. The original poster would tell the story of approaching the old man one day as he seen him walking around with a bunch of small sticks in one hand and a pair of garden clippers in the other. He relayed, that the man stared with intense focus as he clipped the small sticks just right. When he would ask the man, why do you arrange the sticks like this? The man looked up, but never stopped clipping and said, quote, there really isn't any explanation for it. It just is. In 2022, they won't be there. One person said it was an Indian burial ground. Listen, this tree has been scratched up so much. Sigh. The best way to describe it, it is, it just is, end quote which isn't really a coherent answer. The OP would then ask as to what in the world this man meant by this and why he has laid out sticks in his yard obsessively for 40 plus years. The answers varied, but one seemed to be that the man is trying to communicate with someone that passed away years ago and maybe he thinks they are in heaven looking down. However, the overwhelming theory presented, and most likely one, is that the man had some kind of mental illness. As for what he meant about 2022, maybe he was under the assumption he wouldn't live till then. Cosmic Censorship Hypothesis Oh man, here we go with the crazy science theories I was hoping to get away from. The Cosmic Censorship Hypothesis is a concept in theoretical physics and general relativity that suggests that the most extreme and chaotic aspects of cosmic phenomena, such as singularities that can exist within black holes, are hidden from our view and do not affect us directly. In simpler terms, 
It proposes that the universe has a way of protecting us from the extreme and potentially destructive properties of certain cosmic objects. The cosmic censorship hypothesis helps maintain a degree of predictability and order in the universe, even when dealing with incredibly powerful and mysterious phenomena like black holes. However, it is still a subject of active research and debate in theoretical physics, and there are scenarios and mathematical exceptions where it may not be true. So, the mystery revolves around whether cosmic censorship is an absolute principle of the universe, or if there are exceptions and conditions where it breaks down, allowing us to directly observe and understand the extreme properties of certain cosmic phenomena. Sampaku Eyes For this next mystery, you may want to find a mirror, or better yet, just use the camera on your phone. Have you ever heard of Sampaku Eyes? Translated from Japanese, it means three whites, and it is in reference to a person who can see the white above or below the iris of their eyes. It's not typically something I would notice, but maybe you have. But with normal eyes, you are unable to see the white part between the iris and eyelid, whereas Sampaku eyes are a bit more distinctive. In some people, it may even appear that their eyes are bulging out. But where is the mystery, you ask? It all goes back to the practice of Japanese medical face reading, which allegedly goes back thousands of years. According to this bizarre theory, Sampaku could be a good indicator of your fate. If you have white visible at the bottom of your eyes, then supposedly, you are in danger from the outside world, whereas if you can see the white at the top of your eyes, it means the outside world is no danger to you, but instead, your danger comes from within. It means that you are not in control of your emotions, and it can lead to some terrible things. Using this superstition to predict someone's fate really got popular in the 60s, when Japanese author George Osawa began predicting deaths of famous Americans based solely on their eyes. His most famous prediction was in August of 1963, when he predicted JFK would experience great danger because of his Sampaku condition. JFK would be assassinated three months later. With JFK's eyes, you can see the white at the bottom of his iris, meaning that his danger came from the outside world. Other famous people with the lower white of their eyes clearly visible include Princess Diana, Abraham Lincoln, and John Lennon. This theory further expands by explaining those with the white visible below the iris are also more averse to being an alcoholic or drug addict, which might explain Michael Jackson, Marilyn Monroe, and Elvis, who all had this trait. On the other hand, a famous example of someone who has Sampaku above the eyes, indicating turmoil from within, is Charles Manson. And speaking of psychotics, that's another thing Sampaku is supposed to be able to determine. Like with Manson, Sampaku above the eye is indicative of a mental imbalance, typically seen as psychopaths and murderers. These people tend to be more violent. But most depressing of all, having Sampaku eyes in any form is believed to attract accidents and violence to oneself. The mystery is, can you really go by the Sampaku predictions? Scientists say no and liken it to a trait like dimples. And one doesn't read dimples, right? Besides, Billie Eilish has that trait, and she seems okay. I mean, she's no Lana Del Rey, but who is? But I want to hear from you. Anyone watching this have Sampaku eyes? Let me know in the comment section below. Poe Toaster I've already covered this mystery in part 9 of the Mega Series, and if you want to watch a more in-depth explanation, you can click the link in the upper right-hand corner. But basically, the Poe Toaster was a black-clad figure carrying a silver cane and had his face obscured by Scarf or Hood, who visited Edgar Allan Poe's grave every year on his birthday. Astral World Demonic Sacrifice Theory You are probably at least somewhat familiar with this one. On November 21, 2021, rapper Travis Scott was on stage headlining a music festival he had just created a few years prior, that of Astral World taking the name from his third studio album, and what would play out this night would turn out to be simply tragic. The venue was NRG Park in Houston, Texas, between 9 and 10 p.m. The festival had already been dealing with crowd control issues the day before, but this night, he got way out of hand, as a fatal crowd crush would occur, killing eight people at the concert and leaving two more to die in the hospital days later. The cause of death was obviously accidental asphyxiation, with at least one of these people being affected by drugs and alcohol. Another 25 people were hospitalized, 
and more than 300 were treated at the festival's field hospital. The whole thing would go viral, especially on TikTok, where it was documented on camera by multiple concert goers. Scott made the whole thing worse when his apology video seemed insincere. It was heavily ridiculed and turned into a meme. Now that's the backstory, but we're going to look at the conspiracy around it, and that is, rapper Travis Scott, who founded Astroworld and performed there, did all of this to orchestrate a massive satanic ritual, and the deceased concert goers were sacrificed, with some noting that it goes all the way to the top of the music industry, which itself is said to be demonic and exists to collect souls. And this wasn't just one or two people saying this. The comment about the music industry collecting souls got 34,000 likes alone. The theory began to gain traction, and phrases like Astro World Demonic or Astro World Illuminati began to trend. Internet users began to talk about symbols at the concert, which included imagery of flames and burning doves, while others said the stage was an inverted cross leading to hell. Numerology was even brought in, pointing out that Travis Scott and performer Drake's birthdays were 66 months and 6 days apart, which is not true. Others claimed that the crowd was put under a spell before they were crushed, while others went the old route of just linking lyrics to Satan. One of the clips from the tragedy that really fueled the speculation is when one of the alleged concert attendees said Scott was doing demonic stuff and kept going despite hearing people scream for help. Another point of contention was the large head that concert goers had to walk through to get into the festival, which is the same head on the album cover to Astro World. The stage set also looked like the gates of hell, and it didn't help that the theme of the concert was See You on the Other Side. But maybe the most controversial one was the rumor that someone started going around mass stabbing people with syringes filled with a mystery drug. So, is there any merit to any of this? Was this really a satanic sacrifice? Is Travis Scott really a Satanist? Or is this the modern day version of a mom burning her kid's Judas Priest painkiller album? Well, I've given you the so-called proof back in the claim that the theory is real. But one thing that goes against all this was the early warning signs. Even weeks ahead of the concert, alarms were being raised about the ratio of guests to staff. The show also had a ton of security issues, and it was poor planned all around. Poor lighting, very few signs, the main stage was not set up to utilize with crowd control, minimal exit points, only two water stations, access aisles too narrow for security and medical staff to get through. While it may have been a satanic conspiracy, it sure seems like crappy planning, made by someone cutting corners Silent Man. This is another one that I have already covered back on part 12 of the mega series. If you want a more in-depth explanation, you can click the link in the upper right hand corner to watch. But basically, it's this man who goes around and stands in the road blocking traffic without saying a word. Even after being arrested, he refuses to speak. Roman Empire never existed. What if I were to tell you that what many consider to be the greatest empire to ever exist the one that most of the Western world is descended from. The one whose Latin language is still used as the primary language for scientific names. What if I were to tell you that empire never existed? That the whole Roman Empire is nothing more than a fabrication. The conspiracy, like most good things, got popular on TikTok in 2021. The theory by user MomLineal made several claims that allegedly debunked the Roman Empire. One of these being... Hadrian's Wall. The famous wall stretches 73 miles over northern England and was supposed to protect the province of Britannia from the barbarians of the north. However, Mom Lineal claims that it can't be conclusively proven to be a Roman construction. Furthermore, it's not even a wall. Instead, it was a road. But her main claim that most of her theory comes from is that most ancient Roman archaeological sites are inscribed in Greek not Latin, while also citing that there isn't a single Roman document in existence, which is not true, considering manuscripts of Latin poetry have been found that date back as far as between 50 and 25 BC. She also claimed that the Roman Empire myth was created by the Spanish Inquisition, and finally, that the actual city of Rome was not built until the 1500s, and before this, it was just cow fields. Although this theory got made popular by Mom Lineal, who claims to have a bachelor's in history, it's not the first time that this theory was ever presented. It was actually proposed centuries ago 
The first person we know of that hinted around this conspiracy was a French priest and scholar named Jean Hadwan way back in the 1690s. Now Jean, he loved the Latin language and he spent countless hours studying ancient Roman text. However, he started to notice that some of the Latin words and phrases just seemed wrong and he started to suspect a conspiracy. By 1692, he would proclaim that he had uncovered everything and here's where it all gets crazy. Jean believed that the first 1300 years of Christian doctrine had been handed down by an unwritten oral tradition, but by the 14th century, the church fathers, as well as scholars, started to record the tradition to books. But unfortunately, these scholars and theologians got infiltrated by a group of atheist monks led by a mysterious figure called Severus Archonatus, who counterfeited not only everything in these books about Christian doctrine, but also practically everything related to the Roman Empire whom Jean accused of being totally fabricated, even going as far as to say that the writings of Cicero were a work by atheist monks. Although this theory was more based on Jean's grudge against the church, he was still the first to insinuate that the Roman Empire was fake. There would be others in the years that followed that expanded upon his theory though. So as you can see, it goes back pretty far. But let's focus on the modern day version, that of Mom Lineal. Is any of what she says true? Did Rome really not exist? Well, let's start with the obvious. The Roman Empire is just so extremely well documented that this conspiracy is almost impossible to believe. Secondly, is Mom Lineal's format in telling this theory, which is TikTok. Most of her videos debunking ancient Rome are less than a minute long, with the longest being three minutes. In that format, it's very easy to promote her claim. It's saying vague things in a short format and then putting it up to the viewer to actually go and research and dispute her claims, which may take more time than it's worth. But maybe most interestingly, it's possible that Mom Lineal is just lying about her alleged credentials. She claims to have a bachelor's in history and anthropology from Western Kentucky University in 2005. However, after her videos went viral, another TikTok user actually browsed a graduation list from Western Kentucky from 2004 to 2006 and found Mom Lineal to not be listed. Which leads us to the theories. Was she just making up baseless claims for attention? Did she just want views? Most likely, because in her earlier videos, which are now deleted, she did speak of the Roman Empire as a real tangible thing. But it was the videos after this, when she started speaking of Rome not existing, that she went viral and the videos got more and more outlandish. Which makes it seem like she doesn't even believe what she was saying. And finally, she doesn't even cite any sources. But I ask you, do you think it's possible the Roman Empire never existed? Or is this all just Carthaginian propaganda? Jetpack Man Jetpack Man is an unknown person, or perhaps object, that has been observed flying in what is believed to be a jetpack around Los Angeles at least five times in 2020 and 2021. The first sighting came on August 30th, 2020, when two different airline pilots reported seeing a guy in a jetpack just hovering around LAX at 3,000 feet and only about 300 yards off the course of the plane. The interesting thing about this sighting was that there was plenty of visibility. The second sighting came a little over a month later on October 14, 2020, when China Airlines reported seeing a flying object that looked like a flight suit jetpack at 6,000 feet. Now I'm going to skip the third sighting and come back to that one in a second. For now, we'll look at the fourth report, which came on December 21st, when a pilot and flight instructor captured the first video of the object, this time at 3,000 feet near Catalina Island. The Academy would post the video to their Instagram and comment saying it could be the guy in the jetpack or a drone or some other object. The fifth sighting came six months later on July 28th, 2021, when a pilot 15 miles off the coast of California reported seeing the man in a jetpack at 5,000 feet. It would be close to a year after this before another sighting occurred. Now, let's go back to that second sighting, which I skipped for good reason, because it ties into the theory. On this sighting, which occurred in November 2020, a LAPD helicopter crew recorded a video of what appeared to be a balloon of fictional character, Jack Skellington, from the Nightmare Before Christmas, 
This was captured over Beverly Hills, and this balloon was later thought to be that of the Jetpack Man. It was even noted that the movement of the balloon was very similar. The LAPD did not release the video at first, and instead turned it over to the FBI, who, after working closely with the FAA, stated that the one working theory for all the sightings was indeed balloons. However, many dispute this and cite the odds of seeing so many human-shaped balloons in such a short amount of time, as well as pointing out the fact that an experienced pilot could probably tell the difference in a balloon and a person, although there's only a few jetpack manufacturers in the world, and even fewer of these sell to the public, unless someone is building one out of their garage or something. Even then, it's not likely the jetpack tank would have enough fuel to get to the heights that it has been spotted, as they usually only get to about 1,000 to 1,500 feet. Other theories claim that it could be a drone with a mannequin attached to look like a person with a jetpack, yet large drones are not commonly flown at that altitude or distance from land. Others think the incident could be an internet or social media stunt, yet no one has ever came forward claiming so. Not Deer We move next to a scary cryptid, that of the Not Deer, which is said to live right here in good old Appalachia. Most of the sightings take place in Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, Connecticut, and the highest amount coming from Tennessee. It's usually sighted on roads, marshes, meadows, and rivers at night or early morning, early evening when visibility is low. Let's start with the name first, Not Deer, which is a pretty weird name and indicates, hey, it's not a deer. But why is it called that? Well, basically upon seeing one, its appearance is that of a deer. But when you get closer, it is actually something very different, something creepy and strange. The witnesses who have spotted it describe it as looking similar to a deer at first, but much larger, with proportions like a moose, as well as it being black, not brown. They then realize that the creature's eyes are on the front of the head, not on the side like that of a typical deer. They also have legs that bend and move in unnatural ways, almost like a puppet on strings. Its head is also misshapen, and kinda looks like a cow's head. It also has an extremely long neck. Others have described various deformities and noted its call, which sounds like the mixture of a deer and wolf. And when seeing one, people have reported feeling a sense of dread or danger. But the weird thing is that each sighting has small differences. The not deer is also very different than normal deer in another way. They will not avoid humans and flee when approached. They will stand their ground and even some move towards people in erratic jerking motions while making clicking sounds. The cryptid got a lot more notice on, you guessed it, TikTok. But there's some speculation that the legend goes back to the days when Native American tribes once inhabited the Appalachians, which might be why some have suggested it's a skinwalker, which is big in Navajo folklore, or maybe a Wendigo, which is a legend amongst the tribes of the Great Lakes. Or maybe, just maybe, it's the Appalachian version of this monstrosity, which makes more sense considering it seems the not deer just gives off ominous vibes instead of attacking, much like the Wendigo. So what are people actually seeing? Well, one of the leading theories is that of chronic waste disease, or CWD, which is somewhat similar to mad cow disease, except this one affects deer, elk, reindeer, and moose. It affects the central nervous system and causes a deer to behave strangely. Some symptoms include drooling, stumbling, aggression, and lack of fear of humans. The CWD rates are relatively low. Another theory, following this same line of logic, was speculated by channel member Evergreen Wrench, who brought up blue tongue as being the cause. This is another disease mostly found in sheep, but sometimes found in deer, cattle, and goats. It can cause a deer to salivate or foam at the mouth have bloody discharge from the nose, and get swollen blue tinged tongues, which definitely paints a scary picture. However, one thing that may cancel out both of these theories is that both CWD and blue tongue are usually found out west, not in the Appalachians. But that brings me to a counterpoint. Depending on what source you read, not deer may not be strictly an Appalachian thing. Some sources cite that they have been seen all over North America. If that's the case, then CWD and Blue Tongue are both very good theories. 
but if you believe it's just an Appalachian thing, then you can probably rule out either one of those. Other skeptics point out that it's most likely just a deer with birth defects, while one last theory notes that many of the people who have claimed to have seen one were also suffering from sleep deprivation or other factors, which I take to mean drugs or alcohol use. Electromagnetism and the Paranormal We have kind of touched on this one already. When we were discussing electromagnetic fields in the New Mill Mystery Blob case, this kind of just expands on that thought that electromagnetism may be the cause of many types of paranormal phenomena, including objects moving, light anomalies, temperature changes, and that of ghosts and spirits. Hence why ghost hunters often take electromagnetism detectors with them on their hunts. It's theorized that ghosts can be detected by their electromagnetic emissions or that they use electromagnetic energy to manifest. Some even theorize that ghosts use these fields to interact with humans. There's even some devices now that change the toner of a speaker or move a meter needle when the ghost is believed to be increasing the electromagnetic field in an attempt to communicate. But where do electromagnetic fields come from? Well, there's the man-made ones, like in almost every electrically operated technology, as well as natural ones, like the Earth's magnetic field, the sun, seismic activity, and lightning. The earliest studies into the connection started as early as 1875, but it wasn't until the 1980s when some real progress was made. It was started by a man named Michael Persinger, a professor of psychology who believed that electromagnetism might provide enough energy to explain basically all paranormal experiences, from ghosts to UFOs. His most notable experiment involved a helmet he developed called the God Helmet, which exposed portions of the brain to complex magnetic signals of varying intensity. The exposure caused some of the individuals to experience physical and psychological sensations, including some having claimed to have seen a ghostly figure of Jesus within the experimental chamber. However, critics of the God Helmet point out that the reported effects could not be produced again, and stated that the effects probably came mostly from suggestibility more than magnetism. Maybe his most influential work, though, was when he examined an alleged haunted property in 1996. Witnesses who had visited the home reported the following, that since the presence of someone or something, intense feelings of fear, flashes of light, and even the sensation of being touched, upon examining the home, Persinger found the spikes in electromagnetism appeared to coincide with increased episodes of the disturbances which was all traced back to a faulty earth-in electrical wiring circuit. There have been similar studies that kind of back up Persinger's findings. One of these came in 2003 and 2004, when an alleged haunted farmhouse in Cheshire, England was investigated after numerous reported paranormal experiences. A team found that extremely high electromagnetic fields were found in the same rooms as the paranormal experiences, which was caused by a faulty electrical supply cable the paranormal reports faded away after the cable was repaired. However, it's never been conclusively proven that electromagnetism plays any role in paranormal experiences. Crawlers The Crawlers one is a peculiar entry on this iceberg, as it's not listed under cryptids, but instead under the people slash beings category. Additionally, crawlers, which are said to have pale skin, long limbs, a tall, thin body and tends to crawl on all fours are kind of just like a catch-all term for the beings like skinwalkers, wendigos, and flesh gates, which we will look at later. The term was created because wendigos and skinwalkers and various other creatures, maybe even that of the not deer, are tied too deeply to a location and culture, whereas crawlers can be discussed without these ties because by all accounts, this creature is seen all over the world, and it's because of that reason that it makes it really hard to expand upon, because some of these crawlers, such as the Fleshgate, has its own entry, but there is at least one subreddit that discusses the crawlers, to which there seems to be a lot of sightings. Most report that in addition to the long limbs, it has a long body, which is about seven foot tall and has pale or white skin. They also have a stretched out, ghoulish looking face with glowing eyes and is usually encountered in the forest, where it moves quickly from tree to tree. So what are people seeing? A real unidentified being? 
or a misidentified animal. Severed Feet Phenomena On August 20, 2007, a girl visiting Jedediah Island in British Columbia would come across an Adidas shoe along the beach. Curious, she picked it up and opened the sock to find a man's foot. The remains would eventually be identified and traced back to a missing man who had been suffering from depression. It was thought that the man's foot had disarticulated due to decay or scavenger fish, and because of the shoe, it floated to shore. This was a weird enough story on its own, but it only got weirder because six days later, a couple walking along the shore came across another foot that was found 55 miles away from the first one at Gabriola Island, and over the next 10 months, an additional three feet would be found in similar circumstances. It was at this point it would begin to pick up media coverage, and between the time the first foot was found in 2007 and the last one in 2019, a total of 21 were recovered, five in the state of Washington and 16 in British Columbia. At least 13 of those recovered in Canada have been identified with the help of DNA, and by 2017, Canadian authorities were able to rule out foul play and stated that it was their belief that the feet came from people who died either in accidents or by suicide, and that the feet detached due to natural decomposition and then floated ashore in a shoe that had air trapped inside or within the shoe itself. So this sounds like a solved mystery more or less, but it's been pointed out that although extremities such as the hands, feet, and head do often detach from the body as it decomposes, they rarely float. Secondly, it's been deemed unusual or uncommon to find just the foot and no body, and that finding two feet within a week of each other separated by only 50 miles is a million to one odds, which is insane when you consider another 19 would be found over the coming years. But some don't believe the theory presented by authorities and instead point the finger at something darker, like the work of drug dealers, serial killers, or human traffickers. Fleshgate. Now we jump to one of the crawler-type beings that I referenced earlier, that of the Fleshgate. The Fleshgate is an alleged cryptid shapeshifter that can mimic the voice of an animal and humans perfectly. They have really long fingers and usually squat on all fours. They are very tall, thin, pale-skinned creatures and have a head and a face slightly similar to humans, but their nose is very small, or almost looks like they don't even have one, just like a black hole, or it should be. They have no hair, nor antlers, but dark black eyes that glow yellow or red when illuminated by light. They can walk on either two or four legs. They are also good runners, jumpers, climbers, and are very quick and powerful. They can also copy a human's behavior for a short period of time. It's believed they can do this by occupying the victim's body or skin, which sounds gross. How they do this is unknown, but it is assumed that they either eat the insides and wear the skin, or simply skin the victim and discard the organs. But since the flesh gate leaves little to no evidence, it's impossible to tell. They usually will wait for a small group of humans to enter their territory. They will then sneak in and listen to phrases that are easy to mimic and then lure or trick someone else out alone with the phrases and kill them. Or, sometimes, they just wait for one to wander off alone. Before the actual attack, their presence will be known by unexplained noises and or objects being moved while no one is looking. And since they only attack victims when they are alone, it's really unsure what transpires. But what we do know is what happens after the attack. The victim will start acting differently with the most telling sign being that of a complete lack of personality. The victim will be seen staring off into space, studying objects, or paying extra attention to any conversation going on around them in an effort to mimic them. Their phrases will be severely limited and repetitive, like hey or what. The pitch will also sound identical every time. They will also be jumpy and extremely weary of being attacked or identified by other humans. The signs will disappear after a period of time as the flesh gate learns more about humans, but the signs never completely disappear. Once they have possession of the body and have learned enough, they will then try to lure others out into the woods alone by saying things like they need to go collect firewood or food, but they are too afraid to go alone. Once the victim follows them, they will kill that person too. 
that can usually be found anywhere from the forest to the tundra, and according to some reports, they may integrate into human society after consumption of a victim. They're often encountered in locations that are considered off-limits, such as illegal camping sites or military training grounds. However, don't feel completely safe just because you avoid such areas, because they have also been encountered near society, such as popular campsites and forests across from suburbs. Some have stated a good way to determine if someone you know has been fleshed is to ask them personal questions that have not been discussed on the camping trip. Even if they get the answer wrong, pretend it's right and be on high alert. You may have a flesh gate in your presence. At one point, these creatures were also called skinwalkers, but apparently they are just different enough to warrant a name change. And that kind of causes confusion because some sources say that the flesh gate is a type of crawler, while some sources say the word flesh gate and crawler are interchangeable. Regardless, if they are real, it's most likely akin to the skinwalker, wendigo type creature, but more than likely, it's just creepypasta. British Bombed 1939 World's Fair In 1939 and 1940, the World's Fair would be held in New York City. Many countries from around the world participated in it, with over 44 million people visiting over its two seasons. The fair's theme was supposed to be based on the future, and many exhibits were set up to allow visitors to get a look at the world of tomorrow. So it must have been disappointing that just four months into the fair, World War II would begin. This in turn caused many exhibits to be affected, especially those on display in the pavilions from countries under control of Germany. But the fair went on and it was quite a success. TVs were actually brought to the exhibit to show visitors who had never seen one, while Albert Einstein would come give a speech that discussed cosmic rays. However, not everything would go so great. As mentioned, even with how nice everything was, World War II was not far from everyone's mind. So it must have been a shock when on July 4th, 1940, two NYPD officers, 33-year-old Joe Lynch and 35-year-old Freddie Socha, two bomb squad detectives, were dispatched to investigate the British pavilion where a bomb threat had been called in. During this time period, though, Bomb threats were called in like crazy, so it really wasn't anything out of the normal, but this bomb would end up being real. As the two tried to disarm it, it exploded in their face, killing both officers immediately and wounding five others. That bombing was never solved, and it gives us the conspiracy that the British bombed the 1939 World's Fair. But this conspiracy, it's not a crackpot one, because there was evidence linking the bombing as an inside job by William Stevenson a British spy based in New York. Stevenson was a legend, a Canadian soldier, fighter pilot, businessman, and spy master for the British Security Coordination. His code name was Intrepid, and many people consider him to be the real-life inspiration for James Bond. But would he go as far as to set up a bomb at the British Pavilion at the World's Fair? Well, right after the bombing, the British were the furthest from investigators' minds. In fact, everyone assumed that the Nazis or Nazi sympathizers had tried to get at Britain to embarrass them even more at the World's Fair. And there were a lot of German sympathizers in the US, particularly New York at that time. The NYPD began rounding up these people after the bombing, as well as members of the Communist Party, the Irish Republican Army, and the extremist Christian Front. They were all questioned, but the German-American Bund of pro-Nazi Germans living in the US were thought responsible. An arrest was made the next day of a man named Edward Kangeiser after he was found in possession of Nazi propaganda, maps, and weapons. But police quickly found out there wasn't anything in the way of real evidence linking him. The case would eventually go cold, but decades later, a NYPD veteran would actually write a book in 2015 about the NYPD, and he covered the unsolved bombing. He went through the old police records and archives from the time period, he found another theory that was way more viable, that the British planted the bomb themselves to pull America into the war in Europe and help fight the Germans. The ventilation room where the bomb was placed was not open to the public. In fact, the location was known only to the people inside the British pavilion, as well as the anonymous call was probably done in an attempt to prevent casualties while also generating sympathy for Britain. There's also the fact that the British security staff 
were all current or former military and they would not cooperate. They would also make witnesses unavailable and restricted access to the pavilion, which was the crime scene. However, others point out that Winston Churchill would have never ordered such an attack for a few reasons. For one, the crown jewels and Magna Carta were there on display, and he probably wouldn't risk destroying that, as well as the fact that if the U.S. had found out, it would have wrecked any hope of the U.S. coming into the war. Finally, his own mother was from New York. The Last Door of Padanamaswamy Temple Padanamaswamy Temple is located in Kerala, India, and is widely considered to be one of the world's richest shrines and is for sure the world's richest Hindu temple. It is believed to have been built in the 6th century AD and is often in the news over its secret and mysterious vault named B, or traditionally known as Kalara. In 2011, a retired India police officer filed a petition in the Supreme Court to take stock of the temple's unaccounted treasury. The court, in turn, would appoint a seven-member team to make a record of the said hidden treasure. When they went to the temple, they found six chambers labeled A to F. Opening the chamber doors proved to be more difficult than expected, but they finally did get in, well, to most of them. In these vaults, they found gold, diamonds, precious gems, golden coins from the Roman Empire, and stone statues and thrones made of precious metals that came up to about 22 billion US dollars. But for some reason, they refused to try and open Vault B, claiming that whoever attempted to open this one would be met with misfortune. At least, that was the claim. Although, the officer who petitioned for the vaults to be opened did die a few weeks afterwards. Even so, with B remaining closed, it's the largest collection of gold items and precious stones ever found. Vault B, though, which has the image of a cobra on the door, is rumored to be guarded by serpents, a folkloric vampire, as well as other supernatural divinities. They are believed to protect the vault, and anyone trying to open it will be greeted by trouble. And apparently, this isn't something new either. The temple management tried to open the same vault centuries ago, but they began to hear the sounds of waves. Since then, it is believed the vault is somehow connected to the Arabian Sea, and opening it would cause catastrophes across the land. They immediately stopped, stepped back to discuss it, and decided not to try and open it. Which leads us to our mystery. Just what is behind the closed door of Vault B? Well, according to an inventory that was taken in the 1880s, the gold and precious stones in this vault is said to be larger than all of the other rooms. And if the inventory is correct, the gold and precious stones in there would be worth at least a trillion or potentially run into the trillions of dollars. So is the curse really stopping them from getting into this vault? Well, there might actually be a more logical reason to why it has not been opened. The royal family, who has been the custodian of the temple for all these centuries, were not happy when the court ordered an audit to be done. But since they couldn't stop it, they went along with it. Until they got to Vault B, it was here that after making their way through a wooden door, they found an iron door with three locks. One of those locks was rusted over. They decided to call for modern day cutting equipment to come in, like blow torches, to get the steel door opened. It was then that the royal family, who were unhappy with the sacred temple being desecrated, got an injunction from the Supreme Court, which stopped the audit. And to this day, we still don't know what is behind the doors. And that is a mystery that may never be answered. Who built the moon? This is a French theory from the book with the title of the same name. It was written by Christopher Knight in 2005 and alleges that the moon, which possesses few or no heavy metals and has no core, is something that should not be possible. Yet, it's the only reason higher life developed on Earth, which is because the moon is exactly what it is and where it is. So therefore, it cannot be a natural object. It almost certainly has to be artificial. But the question is, who built it? Knight points to various things which proves the moon is artificial. Things like DNA, Sumerian geometry, black holes, megalithic yards, which was an alleged ancient unit of length, numerology, and quantum physics. But his theory, and here's the crazy part, is that humans in the distant future were so smart that they built a time machine, went back to the past, and built the moon, which then set up everything so that we could evolve, which seems like a time paradox to me. The theory is very close to what creationists believe, 
except the moon was built by humans and not a god. Dead internet theory. This is an interesting one that you probably have already heard, and there's a few good videos out there on it right now. Basically, this conspiracy alleges that large proportions of human produced content on the internet are actually generated by artificial intelligence in connection with paid secret media influencers in order to manipulate consumers. The theory rests largely on the feeling that the internet is largely devoid of people, especially when comparing it to the years pre-2007. Interesting websites are gone, there's nothing new to experience or do, and the web is down to a few sites that the majority of users who are still online inhabit. Much like a hot air balloon, which seems huge, but it's just a hollow balloon with air inside. This is further expanded upon by the lost contact with many online users. See, back in the day, there were a ton of internet forums and message boards where people would strike up friendships and keep in contact. According to this theory, many of these people have vanished. In addition, the big forums that are left, for example, 4chan and Reddit, seem to just have the same threads and replies posted over and over, nothing new. It's almost like it's all being copy and pasted. There was also the question of numerous posts that the replies seem to be on topic, but don't come off as sounding like a human typed it. Instead, it sounds like an AI which had been reading these forums and was learning how to reply like a human. In other words, inorganic posting. Which brings us to the real question, who is doing this and why? The answer to that is everyone's favorite boogeyman, that of corporations and government entities. And although that sounds crazy, there's some interesting facts that back it. First of all, was an interesting project that DARPA was working on in 2003 called LifeLog. This was a system which would be able to trace the threads of an individual's life in terms of events, states, and relationships, and it also had the ability to take in all of the person's experience from phone numbers dialed and email messages viewed to every breath taken, steps made, and places gone to, which sounds a lot like social media. However, the LifeLog program was canceled in 2004 after criticism over the privacy implications of such a system, so it's somewhat suspicious that Facebook was founded just a month later. Adding to this conspiracy was the years between 2012 and 2016, when numerous NSA and DARPA contracts were given to Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And in 2016, Google released a bunch of neural linguistic machine learning programs, followed by 2017, when deepfake leaks started to get released. And it's important to point out here that 2016 or 2017 is often the year listed as the death of the internet. And now, depending on the source, 30 to 50% of traffic online is done by bots. But we're not finished, because in 2018, news came out that for years, Reddit, YouTube, and various other sites that use the votes and view counts have been faking and completely manipulating those said votes and counts. In addition to this, a company known as Narrative Science designed a program to write human-like stories. This was documented in 2011, and at the time, it was only used for sports articles, but a few worried that it could be used to start writing news and political articles, making it even weirder is Narrative Science would get several investors in one of these. Yeah, it was the investment arm of the CIA. So is all of this true? Or is the explanation much simpler? Some have proposed that the dead internet theory is nothing more than paranoia and isolation that creep into the lives of people who spend all their time on social media or message boards. The early internet felt more real because it wasn't made up of social media and advertising, and it was far less mainstream, leading to a smaller user base. And if you were on the web back then, you were on for a reason, not just mindless scrolling. And we come to the end of the first part of the Obscure Mystery Iceberg Explained. If you can, let me know in the comments down below if you liked it, and if you would want to see more of it in the future. For now, I will say, good night, and goodbye.